Americans are great innovators. We have a great history of invention from Eli Whitney and the cotton gin, Alexander Graham Bell, the telephone, to the Wright brothers, to Thomas Edison, all the way up to operating systems and iPods and so forth. These are things. Americans also invent ideas from our founding documents and the notion that all men are created equal. And the forward pass, when you think about it, fits nicely into that tradition. It's a great innovation that turns a sport like rugby into American football. You're going to be a football player. Today is the best day of your life. Believe me, he might be the finest quarterback produced in the last 10 years. He needs a day like this. That's all I need. Fortunately for me, I didn't lose my life. I didn't lose my job. Football convinced me that life is a team game. Rest of your life. Nobody can ever tell you that you couldn't do it. This is the story of what gave football life. The missing link in its evolution into the world's greatest spectacle. This afternoon we're going to play the biggest football game in the history of Western civilization. But in the beginning, there was only the run and the kick. In the 19th century, the two kinds of football were soccer and rugby. Neither of them allowed the forward pass. The forward pass is completely alien to the game of football. It is football, after all, not something else. The earliest surviving film is from 1903, shot by Thomas Edison of the University of Chicago in Michigan. Basically, it's one line plunge after another. There weren't many options for how to move the ball every play kind of looks like what you would expect from like a goal line surge during a blizzard. People are just sort of hammering into each other, trying to incrementally move the ball. If you succeed, uh, you keep going, and if you don't, you just punt. Punting seemed like half the game. Football wasn't just dull, it was deadly. And at the dawn of the 20th century, much of the country was ready to abolish it. Football had this enormous problem with violence and brutality. In 1905, football had its most fateful season ever. The important thing to know about the year 1905 is that 18 people died playing football that year. It's an amazing statistic when you think about it. 18 people died playing football. There was no pro football at the time, but there was big time college football, and these deaths we're at the big time college football level all the way down to Sandlot. When you consider the numbers of people who are actually playing the sport in America at the time, that's a big number. Spokesmen for the colleges, who were the major football powers, decided something had to be done. We're a civilized country and we're not going to kill our young men on the field of play. There was this idea that football, at least in the minds of some of the progressive reformers, was this barbarous relic from an earlier day. <laughs> Newspapers are full of these unbelievably lurid, graphic illustrations. Kind of skeleton figure holding a football in a graveyard, death as the twelfth man on the field. There was this growing social, political, cultural movement that wanted to prohibit football, that wanted to outlaw this game. A number of schools actually abandoned football. Columbia, Northwestern, out on the West Coast, Stanford and Cal switched from football to rugby. The prohibition movement that had wanted to ban football, outlaw football, do away with football, they thought they were finally going to get their way. What they didn't count on was the intervention of President Theodore Roosevelt. Of all games, I like football best and would rather see my boys play it than see them play any other I have no patience for those who declaim against it because it necessitates rough play and occasional injuries. My name is Joe Wiegand. I'm a Theodore Roosevelt repriser, and it always amazes me how audiences get a big kick when they hear the story of how Teddy Roosevelt saved football. It is a good thing to have the personal contact 
about which the New York Evening Post snarls so much, I would hundredfold rather keep the game as it is now, with the brutality, than give it up. He considered football to be the greatest American sport because it really tested people. And he really feared for America's future. If a generation came of age and had never played football, what kind of country would that be? Roosevelt, of course, is the guy who invented the term bully pulpit. He knows how to use the office of the presidency to move public opinion. Act as good citizens in the same way I'd expect any one of you to act in a football game. Don't flinch, don't fall, and hit the line hard. He invites to the White House the coaches from Harvard, Yale, and Princeton, and says to them, football is on trial. Because I believe in it, we must work to save football. A few days after, he received a note from a businessman in Massachusetts saying, let's have the forward pass. People have been talking about this for a while. Roosevelt took this note and he sent it on to Walter Camp. If you read between the lines, he's saying, why don't you do this? The key man in developing the rules of football had always been Walter Camp. He dominated the rules committees. He's the one who came up with assigning the ball to one side or the other, who basically created the specialized positions. Camp had no desire for the forward pass. Walter Camp's vision of football was like rugby. This is a book by Walter Camp on football. And I think we can tell what he thinks about the forward pass in these short lines. The English game was one of traditions. What has been done can be done. What has not been done must be illegal. <laughs> Walter Camp didn't stand a chance against the president. And Theodore Roosevelt outmaneuvered him. Roosevelt could not tell the rules-making body what to do. But he did have some authority over Paul Daschle the most famous referee in football. Because Dasha, when he wasn't refereeing football games, was a professor at the Naval Academy. Paul Dasha was also up for promotion, and it was Roosevelt's to give to him. So Roosevelt starts sending Dasha notes saying, why don't you support some of the changes that'll help eliminate brutality in the sport, and why don't we push for the forward pass? Let's think about the forward pass. I'd like you to start doing this at your committee meetings. Paul Daschle got his promotion, and in a sudden about-face, threw his support behind the reformers, and in the spring of 1906, America did something the rest of the world had never imagined. It legalized the forward pass. Walter Camp was not powerless. He understood the forward pass was coming. He couldn't do anything to stop it, but he could make it something that nobody would want to do. Coming up. This would be like throwing a manhole cover. <laughs> oh my goodness. That thing is like throwing a weighted basketball with laces. Uh a forward pass is thrown by laying the ball in the hand with either one finger or the thumb curled around it. And it's thrown above the shoulder, straight past the eyebrows with the forward point up. And the passer follows through. Did Newt Rockney invent the forward pass? As Notre Dame's head coach, he represented the ideal of American innovation. As a Notre Dame player, his role in a legendary 1913 upset of Army fueled the Rockney as creator myth that was later embellished by Hollywood. A majority of Americans believe that Newt Rockne invented the forward pass. It was the movie, Newt Rockne All-American, that began the myth. Coach, let us use the forward pass. I know it'll work. I'm not so sure. We've never seen it in the game. Neither is the Army. What can we lose? All right. It's your idea, Rock. If you think you can put it over, go ahead. In a lot of the movie portrayals of that 1913 Army Notre Dame game, the long gray line or Newt Rockne All-American, you get the impression that this is the first time Army had seen a forward pass and the first time anybody had used a forward pass. Did you see that, sir? It's illegal. It's a foul. It, it, it's baseball. It's legal, all right. And that's just not true. The forward pass has been around for a while. Forward pass. 
I think it's much more satisfying to think of a creation moment, a single dramatic event that changes history. The evolution of the forward pass is a long and complicated and sometimes technical story. After legalization in 1906, the football life of the forward pass was governed by a restrictive set of rules and regulations that were urged by Walter Camp. There was a period where you could not score a touchdown with a forward pass. A pass that went out of bounds was turned over to the opposing team. If the ball hits the ground without anyone touching it, it goes to the defensive team. One of the problems with the forward pass was the ball was essentially a rugby ball. This is a rugby ball from 1869, and this thing is like a basketball. I mean, you could actually bounce it and probably shoot some uh, free throws with it. Slinging footballs from earlier eras posed a challenge to a former NFL MVP. Here it is, the rugby ball. Good luck. Hey. Oh my God. <laughs> Oh my goodness, there's no way. That thing is like throwing a weighted, a weighted basketball with laces. In 1909, the size of the ball was reduced for the first time. This thing isn't much better than the last ball. As a matter of fact, feeling this right here, I feel like it's harder to throw because it's fatter and it's heavier. This would be like throwing, you know, a manhole cover. Pretty impossible. Watermelon balls now, guys. I don't know where they're going to go. I have no idea. Hey! Not pretty. Oh, my God. While the ball was heavy, opposition to the forward pass was even heavier. A lot of people criticize the forward pass as somehow being a feat, being a trick, not playing the game the way gentlemen should play the game, not being willing to slug it out, a kind of coward's trick. While the Eastern establishment thought the forward pass was for sissies, a different mindset existed in the Midwest. The 1913 Notre Dame squad transformed the forward pass from a trick into a tactic. The fighting Irish were led by quarterback Gus DeRay and an end named Rockney. When the Westerners from South Bend took a voyage eastward, the forward pass entered a brave new world. Well, in 1913, we had Columbus coming to America in terms of football, and that's when Notre Dame showed up to play Army on the East Coast that season. Army was a great powerhouse that year. They were unbeatable according to all the East Coast newspapers. November 1st, 1913. Army versus Notre Dame on the plains at West Point. 500 persons packing the sidelines for the first appearance in the East of the Notre Dame team that holds no fears for the cadets who are supremely confident of victory. Certain that they will defeat the Westerners by a decisive score. And then the game is on. Doré, agile as a cat, cool as a cucumber, fades and passes to Newt Rockney for 25 yards. What a player, that man Rockney. What Notre Dame did different that day is that the race and Rockney had worked out a button hook system where Rockney was running patterns, there were timing patterns, so that was different. Rockney. Orton. Rockney caught one of three touchdowns thrown by DeRay, who completed 14 passes and 17 attempts for 243 yards. In some ways, you could almost call Notre Dame the first West Coast offense with what DeRay and Rockney would do with some of the planning they do with it. Rockney would cut back on a timing pattern with the quarterback, and nobody was doing that sort of thing, and the defensive backs couldn't react to it. They, they didn't understand that, that particular pattern. Passes begin to sail through the air again, and before the cadets know what is going on, it's a great day for the Irish as the final score reads Notre Dame 35, Army 13. 
What happens that's really important at West Point in 1913 is not the introduction of the forward pass, but the successful exploiting of the forward pass with the New York sports writers present. The Notre Dame Army game in 1913 became a cultural touchstone. It became a part of the, the story of football. The idea seems to be that we need a way to sort of explain that football at one point was just guys running into each other in the middle of the field, and it became this really expansive, dynamic, exciting game. There needs to be some point where we say, this is where it began, and the 1913 game is what we've picked. Something happened never before seen in football. So that's always going to be the story. There's never going to be a time when that game is not seen as the origin of passing as the most important part of football. Newt Rockney didn't invent the forward pass, but he helped it take a giant step towards the future. Coming up. If Tom Brady was a slot receiver, would he date Giselle? Man's early attempts at flight were not pretty. Spread your wings. Now jump. And in the three decades after its breakthrough at West Point, neither were attempts at the forward pass. Teams back in the stone age of the forward pass only attempted about 15 passes per game. Compare that to modern football where it's about 30 attempts. There was no strategy to the forward pass. Teams literally just heaved the ball downfield and hoped their guy caught it. Now back to pass again. There it goes, but it's intercepted by Brock. When you go back and read some of the coaching notes, they actually tell them to hold that football in the palm of their hand and throw it from a spot like this. The only way you can throw that football is more of a shot, but looks more like the Statue of Liberty that does a quarterback pass in the ball. Fed Donowski's spectacular triple threat map, one of the league's best passes. There were two formations that dominated in the 20s and 30s. Pop Warner's single wing offense and Newt Rockney's Notre Dame box or shift. And if you have the dominant team, you'll go out and run the ball and run the ball and run the ball. The quarterback as we know it, the, the all-American hero, the leader of the team, that position didn't exist. Slinging Sammy Barr, he was still called a halfback in game programs and game reports. Sammy Barr is again in the tailback position. You were running back's number, number 33. Sid Luckman wore number, number 42. When these guys started their careers, they were not what we know as quarterbacks. The quarterback, he was predominantly, you know, in the execution of plays, a blocking back. And the ball is snapped to a halfback or a tailback, and the quarterback is sort of midway between the halfback and, and the line of scrimmage. He's the guy who calls the signals and he calls the plays, but, but he is not the passer. Hugh McCullough, star halfback, passes to Sam Boyd. The chief passer in the single wing is the tailback or the halfback. Back in the single wing days, there was three things that the single wing tailback had to do. One kick, two run, and three pass. That guy had to be able to kick or, it, you know, he really couldn't play. Drop kick was very important because of the way they scored points. The forward pass was not developed. There was three yards in a cloud of dust and hammered up in there. Most of the guys dropped it straight on with a locked ankle and would square toe. It wasn't a high percentage thing, but because of the ball built the way it was, it was a lot, lot easier to kick than today's ball. One man liberated football from its reliance on the kick. He couldn't keep a steady job and was regarded in coaching circles as a crank. But Clark Shaughnessy was convinced his T formation could change the football world. And here he is, the man who spells touchdown with a capital T, Clark Shaughnessy. Clark Shaughnessy is kind of the mad scientist of the forward pass. He put into place the foundations of modern offensive football. The quarterback on the center, man in motion, flankers and split ends, what we would now call wide receivers. Those were all part of Clark Shaughnessy's T-formation revolution. Let's take a closer look at this blackboard he's working on. Any doubt as to why it's called the T? Out of the huddle, into their T-formation. With the T-formation, you've got 
quarterback, of course, directed behind center. The, the key formation really creates the pocket passer. The quarterback is the key man in the team. You want this guy to do what? What? What the heck are you talking about? In the single wing offense, I have 11 on 11. When the quarterback went under center, now I'm playing a 10 on 11 game. I'm basically taking a guy off the field that all he does is hand the ball off or throw the ball down the field. You can see where coaches would go, that's crazy. I'm sure the first time a quarterback moved from shotgun under center was very uncomfortable for number one, the quarterback, and number two, the center. The T-center places the ball in the quarterback's hand. This masculine gladiator type sport, and you're walking up, putting your hands up under the center's butt. Shaughnessy's ideas for the quarterback seemed bizarre, but they worked. Here comes the T-formation of Clark Shaughnessy. Frankie Albert boxes his arm back. That was a long pass. When the Chicago Bears used the T in the 1940 NFL championship, the result was stunning. The Bears are unstoppable. The final score is Bears 73, Redskins nothing. The schematics of the T were subversive. A streamlined football, specially calibrated for the forward pass, made them revolutionary. This is the Duke ball, and this started in the early 40s. It's named after Wellington Mara. He was the owner of the Giants at the time. Wellington Mara was actually named after the Duke of Wellington. And he was the one who did the contract with Wilson. So therefore, Wilson decided to call it the Duke. These balls are so light. You can get your whole hand around it. Nice. The Duke was easy to throw, but hard to kick, and took the foot out of football. The forward pass has basically been the death of the drop kick. Now the kickers have to kick a harder ball. The sweet spot on it's a lot smaller. <laughs> that was a horrible drop. Oh, there's a... God, those are ugly. I quit. Thanks to the Duke, the melon ball's end-over-end end flailing ducks became tight spirals, and the re-engineered forward pass gave birth to a uniquely American game and a uniquely American hero. The position of quarterback was this fulcrum point where everything changed and the trajectory of forward passing. The position of quarterback is famous in a way no other position in any other sport is. This will be my first football game. <laughs> ever. So, ever. I know Joe Montana is supposed to be really great. The quarterback is the passer. He's the most important guy. The most important guy is doing the most important thing, which is effectively throwing the ball down the field. I got to see this. This far about him. Red ball. Everyone knows that it's the center of the game. If Tom Brady was a slot receiver, would he date Giselle? Well, it's possible he might. It's very possible Wes Welker could have ended up dating Giselle, but it doesn't seem like it, right? Joe Flacco has a better chance to date someone like Giselle than Wes Welker. Coming up. He's gonna go with the deep bomb. When it gets there, it is as satisfying as anything in life. The forward pass is like the greatest lovemaking you've ever been a part of. Own NFL, a football life season two today on DVD. Probably Sid Gilman was the biggest game changer. He seemed to be the first guy to either really think about or to think about and implement the idea of vertical passing. In the 1960s, Sid Gilman and proponents of the forward pass flocked to the upstart American Football League. The AFL has got Gilman and really the dawn of the modern forward pass. On the other side, the NFL has got what? They've got Vince Lombardi. I uh, think of football as a running game. I get more enjoyment out of seeing a well-executed running play than I do a well-executed pass play. The classic Lombardi play, of course, is the, is the Green Bay sweep. In fact, it's an old single wing play. What we're trying to get is a seal here, and a seal here, and try to run this play in the alley. It's like football back at the turn of the 20th century. 
kind of power play that appealed to every coach. And, I want to run out of there. and that was the way you won games, rather than by putting it up in the air. The AFL didn't just challenge the NFL's philosophy, they challenged its football. The AFL had a different football. They had the J5V. The ball designed to accentuate the forward pass. Kind of had a space age name to it, right? You would see J5V on a on a rocket or a spaceship or something that Chuck Yeager flew, right? The J5V was a quarter inch smaller. That ball looked like it had helium in it. For me, a quarter of an inch makes that big of a difference. This ball is longer, it's thinner, it's shaped like a missile. It's shaped to go through the air. It's a great ball, it's thin, it cuts through the air, it's light. You can get your whole hand around it. That thing feels like I'm throwing darts. Just like Joe Namath would have thrown it. I, uh, I feel very comfortable with the ball. The Duke wasn't as pointed at the ends. It didn't feel that way you could get an easier spiral. And that was what fans got. A bold, daring forward pass that was so explosive, Americans could only compare it to one thing. In the 1960s, in the heart of the Cold War, the notion of the bomb is ever-present in American culture. That helped glamorize the forward pass. play a lateral game. I want to play a vertical game. Gonna go with the deep bomb. I mean, he really hangs it up. The Raiders are gonna come after you. They've got the speed to do it, and they will do it. It's like having the bomb and being willing to drop it. Throwing a deep bomb, a leap in the end zone. The lefty caught, makes the catch. Touchdown, Raiders! Throwing the bomb and hitting that long pass is just uh, electrifying. It still is, just thinking about it. Wow, you know, you get goosebumps. Lamas looking for the end zone, throwing touchdown to Maynard. That lightning strike, that sudden burst of excitement, yes. In football, the object is for the quarterback, otherwise known as the field general, to be on target with his aerial assault, riddling the defense by hitting his receivers with deadly accuracy in spite of the blitz, even if he has to use the shotgun. With short bullet passes and long bombs, he marches his troops into enemy territory. He is going to throw long for Don Maynard, and Maynard makes the catch! In baseball, the object is to go home. <laughs> and to be safe. Thanks to the forward pass, the game was never over. There was always the chance that you could pull off a miracle by being able to, to throw the ball uh, a long way. Well, the Cowboys need a miracle. Staubach has him in the shotgun formation. Roger takes the snap. Lumps it once. He's going long. When I threw the forward pass, I closed my eyes and said, Hail Mary. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Blessed are thou amongst women, blessed is the fruit of thy Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Down the near sideline from Drew Pearson. Pearson makes the catch of the five. Touchdown! Stobach hit Pearson on a 50-yard touchdown. Would you believe it? You know, it was unbelievable. I mean, that everybody just silence and... And what happened is the Associated Press, instead of saying the bomb wins the game or the alley-oop, they said Hail Mary pass wins game. When it happened again, the announcers started using the term Hail Mary. Final play, but hang it up in the end zone, they roll up in the air, and it's a touchdown, a Hail Mary. Here comes the Hail Mary. And that term really stuck with people. Trips are on the right, we're going Hail Mary, batted. They fight. Touchdown! Touchdown! To name it after a prayer, it sort of shows football does have a greater possibility for the near miracle, which is enough. Because a near miracle is called a miracle. In the Persian Gulf, there was, the term was used as a Hail Mary for our troops. We did what could best be described as the Hail Mary play in football. I think you recall when the quarterback 
is desperate for a touchdown. Every single one of his receivers goes way out to one flank, and he lobs the ball. It really has become a term now used in football and in politics. Governor Romney calls for a Hail Mary, ending Medicare as we know it. I could have said our father, glory be. It would be the our father pass. The Blessed Virgin th thinks a lot of me anyway. I got, got her on the map. <laughs> Up next. It was brutally hard to score points. It was an era ruled by defense, and the forward pass was dying. The forward pass saved pro football in the early days, but later on, pro football saved the forward pass. If you look in the 1970s, it got increasingly difficult to pass the football. We'd be watching film, and your receiver is coming over the middle, and someone just cold cocks him until the ball was in the air. One of the safeties could hit him, do anything they wanted to him. It was brutally hard to score points. It was an era ruled by defense, and the forward pass was dying. Two men saved the forward pass. The first was a man so unorthodox, he installed a phone line. Hello? On a Douglas fir tree. Hey, just fine, just fine, but you're too late, you know? We drank the wine, we ate the crab. Don Coryell didn't just throw it deep. He wanted to go long on every play. And Don, I maintain, is the only coach in the history of the NFL that when he came on the phone and he said, let's start getting after their ass, you know, he'd go like that. What he meant was start throwing it. We gotta start throwing it. Don wants to get after him. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Air Coriel and your pilot Dan Fouts, welcome to San Diego. This is the best way to win football games. Get the ball downfield and throw it. Go for the mother. Back to passes. Fouts again throwing deep to Joyner. Touchdown, Chargers! The people that have to have the most guts are the ones that are trying something new and different. It was Bill Walsh who presided over the triumph of the forward pass. None of that seemed possible when the Stanford coach was hired by the San Francisco 49ers in 1979. Walsh had the demeanor of a college professor and his mentor, the great Paul Brown, doubted his toughness. Whenever any team that was thinking of hiring Walsh for a head coach came to Brown, he badmouthed Walsh. And one of the things he said about him was he was just too soft. Holy smoke, Bill. We keep trying that same darn thing and we keep getting knocked in our pride every time. Nobody in the NFL was going to give him a head coaching job because of what Brown was saying about him. When he took the Stanford job, it was because it was the only head coaching job he could get. I've always been enamored in this sense, had a lot of interest, excitement in the forward pass. And we worked to develop sort of a low-risk forward passing game. It was very prevalent that passing was too risky. And it was the way that they were thinking about it. But the way Bill talked about it, the short passing game, it was the extension of your running game. Montana drills a pass, slant into Rice. Throwing the slant to Jerry Rice. Touchdown, Morty! was the same risk as tossing it, in his mind, to Roger Craig. He set the run up with the pass, completely opposite of what everyone had done forever. The other thing I like about this 49er team is they start out passing to establish a run. We set the run up with the pass. The whole thing was turned on its head for the betterment of football forever. Montana looks downfield, lofts it way downfield, Rice is there! Touchdown! Like all the prophets of the forward pass, Walsh was initially written off as eccentric. We didn't try to have the biggest offensive linemen and control the game by running the football. We were labeled a finesse team. Here comes the, the finesse dink and dunk, white wine drinking. 49ers from San Francisco, California. They wanted to dismiss the 49ers as a gimmick. Finesse was one of the charged words that were used. Coach, how would you describe your football team? Is it a finesse team or power team? We'd like to think finesse is not the word for our offense. 
along with the 49ers finesse goes ferocity for Chicago. They weren't man enough to play real football. They had to go out and play girly kind of football. Montana back to throw. Running around and going where people aren't. Looking, throwing, touchdown, 49ers. Anytime a guy thinks he's rough and tough, four out of five of those guys get their ass to kick. Because most of those kind of guys are dumb. It really pissed Bill off that it was called the West Coast offense. It was no accident that this name was supplied by Bill Parcell who, after thumping the 49ers in the playoffs in 1986, greeted the press with the statement, how does that West Coast offense look now? And suddenly, it became the West Coast offense. The West Coast moniker was supposed to be an insult to the forward pass and its foremost champion. For over 60 years, men have been devising ways to advance the football. But perhaps the most spectacular is through the forward pass. But Walsh kept winning. The 49ers have won it. Bill Walsh, a team that compounded pro football observers. And winning. Super Bowl 19 is in the record books. The 49ers have won it. And winning. Stepped up throws. After three quarters of a century, the forward pass had conquered football. Bill Walsh had created the football of the future. Bill Walsh made the modern use of the forward pass what it is today. Coming up. The forward pass is mentioned. Marching band is mentioned. I had never heard the theory that the jester wearing the cast was Joe Namath instead of Bob Dylan. A football life is... Steps up, throws deep, far sideline, Jacoby Jones has it at the 20, touchdown! One forward pass can change everything, just as the forward pass saved football from abolition in 1905. Without Roosevelt and the forward pass, what would have happened to football? Would the prohibitionists have won? Yes, they may have won. Football might have been abandoned, it might have been outlawed. It might have been erased from our cultural landscape. The forward pass wasn't just a reform that fixed football's problem of violence. It did that, but it also made the game more fun. It made it a better sport. He's done it down here. He's got it wide open. It is going to be a touchdown. Look at Brett Hart coming off the field. He is so happy. Look back at old footage of football at the turn of the 20th century. What you notice most is dust and those huge scrums that look a lot like rugby. Whereas when you look at football today, what you notice most is air. If football is on, I watch it. It doesn't matter what else is on or who's playing. I love football a lot. <laughs> How much does this do to the forward pass? This is a weird, I guess, I guess in totality. Because if it wasn't for the forward pass, football would be such a different game, I can't even relate to how I would feel about it. Young Apples fall down, throws to the end zone. Take a look at the greatest plays of the last 50 years. It's hard to come up with anything like a comprehensive list without going back time and again to the forward pass. The pass is exciting. You don't know what's going to happen until it comes down. 
in and out of hands, bouncing around. It creates things that are painful or joyful. They must go in with a bomb. The kind of football we have today is so different from football in the rest of the world. You know, the forward pass is what makes the game most different from soccer and rugby. It is profoundly an American game. It is painted red, white, and blue. One of the most powerful images in American culture is the father throwing the ball to his son in the backyard. That's a forward pass. Other countries don't do this. They play rugby, they flip it back, they play soccer, they kick it around. We Americans, we're all about freedom and liberty. We can flip it back, we can kick it, but more importantly, we can throw it. And nobody can throw it like an American. Even one of America's most iconic songs, Don McLean's American Pie, references the forward pass. And a Google search will yield some bizarre interpretations of the lyrics. Certainly, the lyrics to American Pie are about as straightforwardly cryptic as you can be. I had never heard the theory that the jester wearing the cast was Joe Namath instead of Bob Dylan. There is football iconography in the song. The, the, the forward pass is mentioned, a marching band is mentioned. There's enough there to make it seem like, well, he must be talking about something. Hey, you guys. Oh, my nose. Where's Ricky Sanders? I like the idea that this whole documentary is about the idea of the forward pass because the word forward has kind of been dropped. In the not too distant past, that was used as a way to describe what it was. When Don McLean says, like, the players tried for a forward pass, it, if, 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 if he just said the players tried for a pass or attempted to pass, I'm not sure if people would have immediately associated that with some kind of conceptual football game. Most inventions come and go, but the great ones, like the forward pass, continually reinvent themselves. We've evolved quite a bit in the sport of football to pass the game. The way it's changed over the years, from throwing with a wind-up like a baseball pitcher, seeing Peyton Manning carrying the ball high from step one where he can get rid of it. It's joyful. Could I imagine the game of football without the forward pass? I really couldn't. I could imagine the game without running the ball. Running the ball is a waste of time. You have to have seven good blocks to run the football. When you're throwing the ball, you can get the ball to a guy in open space. Now he's only got to make one guy miss. I am certain in my lifetime we are going to see an NFL team that doesn't run the ball. Ever. Doesn't use any running players. We gotta make this score bigger than that. At some point, there's just going to be some sort of forward-thinking coach who's going to say, you know, I've crunched the numbers and the value of running the ball is less than any pass play. And the guy who does this, he is going to get hammered in the media. And other coaches are going to hate him. He's going to seem like an extra crazy Mike Martz. And then they will succeed and other people will do it. And that will really sort of be the sport of football changing 180 degrees from a game in 1905 when there was no passing to a game when that's all that there is.